Allora, buongiorno a tutte e a tutti e benvenuti al 114 Lunch Seminar eh, che oggi verrà tenuto da eh, Thomas Le Bonnier dell'Institut Polytechnique de Paris. Eh, Thomas Le Bonnier sta facendo un, un periodo di visiting, è un dottorando e eh, sta facendo un periodo di visiting qui al, al centro Nexa. Eh, sulla tematica proprio uh, che presenterà oggi al Lunch Seminar, che eh, è all'intersezione tra eh, il GDPR e la uh, protezione dei dati personali con il lavoro umano uh, celato dietro l'intelligenza uh, artificiale. E sta conducendo il, il dottorato sotto la supervisione di Antonio Casilli, fatto di Feglio del, del Centro Nexa e di, come lui giustamente mi ricorda, di, di Corinne la professoressa eh, Corinne Vercher dell'Università di Sorbonne, se ricordo bene, giusto? Ah, di stress, ok. Um, è un, uh, un piacere avere eh, Tomà qui con noi a presentare la sua ricerca. La presentazione sarà in inglese e um, come nostra abitudine faccio fare un brevissimo giro di presentazione di, di chi è presente qui uh, attorno al tavolo. Eh, vi chiedo di farla in inglese così che il nostro interlocutore possa, possa, eh, possa capire. E ricordo a tutti che l'incontro è, è anche in, eh, in diretta sulla virtual classroom del centro Nex e verrà registrato e sarà possibile nella seconda parte dell'incontro interloquire anche da remoto con, ehm, con il presentatore. Um, detto questo, mi introduco velocemente eh, in inglese. My name is Antonio Vetro, I'm a professor here at Politecnico di Torino, uh, a software engineer and member of the, of the Nexa Center. Uh, Are you? Okay. Uh, my name is Lorenzo Laudadio, I'm uh, a PhD student here at Politecnico di Torino uh, on uh, software engineering path. I'm Giacomo Colti, project manager here at Nexa Center. I'm Valeria Bergantino and I'm in charge of the communication model. I'm Marco Rovina and I am a PhD student and uh, my research focuses on uh, responsible UI. I'm Giovanni Garri, particularly manager of the next assignment. I'm Emilia Pogliari, I'm a student at the University of Florida in Communication and I'm doing this stage at the next assignment. Thank you. Many others are connected remotely, um, but now it's time to give the floor to uh, Tomale Bonnier. Many thanks. Great. Well, um, Of course, uh, like in many, like in every other presentation like this, the first thing to do is to um, say thank you to the Nexus Center for welcoming me and helping me out uh, with uh, my research. Um, so uh, today I will be talking about uh, the intersection between AI labor and the general data protection regulation, and more generally about personal data protection. Um, because this is a topic that you cannot actually avoid when you're talking about uh, the production of AI systems. So, um, the way I'm going to do this presentation is, first of all, I'm going to show you the list of um, topics that I'm going to go through, and then um, towards the end I will be uh, talking a little more about uh, how I have thought about organizing Uh, the research that is constituting, constitutive of my uh, PhD. So, uh, let's get started. And uh, this, of course, the first part, uh, AI labor and humans in group. I'm just going to be very brief about this because there is uh, a lot of uh, research that has been produced uh, in that particular aspect of things. Um, this is uh, the digital labor tradition. And my goal is to actually try and reconcile this with uh, all of uh, the work that is being done at the moment with AI and the personal data regulation in order to produce a better understanding of regulation, not in the sense of what the law says, but in the sense, but in a more sociological sense. So let's get started and determine, define what AI labor and humans in the loop might mean. Um, I think this is the best, most simple way to, uh, like, acknowledge, to, to acknowledge this. Uh, this is um, this image has, was produced by uh, 
Roland Zawar, Antonio Casilli, and Marion Coville back in 2020. And what they did here was provide a short, simple typology of the most evident types of labor that are required to produce uh, an AI system. And so uh, those can be divided into three main categories, preparation, impersonation, and verification of AI systems. So on the top left, so on the left part of the screen, you see the AI, the AI preparation part, which is data generation. And that also includes personal data, taking pictures of your face, for example, and also data annotation, which means, for example, looking at these pictures uh, of faces or um, listening to voice recordings and um, putting them into the different categories. So that means that there is work on personal data going on that as well when you're talking about this particularly. Then uh, I'm going to skip the AI personation and go uh, straight forward to the AI verification part, which is uh, all that is related to um, the checking and controlling of any output that may be produced by an AI system. You can think of it as, for example, when you go to chat to um, um, uh, chat GPT's uh, website and they ask you to provide, uh, in a sense, you are asked to provide feedback by the means of a green or a red thumb. So that would be AI verification. And then you have AI impersonation, which is like the moment where um, you are, you have workers who pretend to be an AI system or actually are embedded into that system in order to produce, instead of automation, something that we might instead call heteromation because it is not just an automated system, but it's also a contribution that has been uh, the result of an output, of an input by a human inside the loop. Right, so uh, a very quick word here about work platforms, which, is a, which are an essential part of this very complex uh, um, network uh, uh, of production. Um, because first of all, we need to uh, acknowledge that the fact that it's a planetary system, um, it is um, a digital, um, uh, what's it called, uh, chain of production. And uh, this chain of production relies heavily on work platforms. So this is a graph that was produced by Florian Schmidt back in 2022. And what he shows here is the spike of um, traffic in, some of, in one of several work platforms uh, back in April, July and October of 2018. And um, that is also the moment there is a confluence at that point where uh, you have the automobile industry that is uh, starting to train algorithms to produce um, uh, autonomous vehicles and you also have a crisis, an economic crisis in Venezuela. So you find that at that moment people in Venezuela starting going more and more on those work platforms in order to do this annotation work and in order to be paid in dollars. Um, in, and so this is, I think, a good representation, a good example of how complex these systems are and how they spike the entire globe and also how they are dependent on labor that is in uh, countries that, for lack of a better, of a better word, uh, you would call, uh, you would define as being in the global south, which means that as countries like the United States, States and France and other members of the European Union are AI producers, they are actually, again, relying on labor that comes from the other end of the world. Right. So it doesn't mean that, uh, data, that uh, data annotation is exclusive to uh, countries that uh, are in the so-called Global South. You also find them in the European Union. And so this is uh, a research that was put out, uh, published in April 2024, um, the Encore project. And the question was uh, about the European workers of uh, artificial intelligence. And so the, we conducted a series of interviews with um, uh, platform workers in six countries inside the European Union. That includes Portugal, Germany, France, and uh, several others that I cannot remember at the present moment. And also a series of questionnaires that have been put out in some of those uh, work platforms in order to understand their working conditions. Um, but that is not uh, specifically my uh, uh, topic of research. So uh, moving on before I start talking about personal data production. Um, maybe this is a point where I offer an, uh, another definition of AI because I see that oftentimes whenever we're uh, in these, um, um, when we're talking about AI, when we're talking uh, uh, about it from a, an academic perspective, from a legal perspective, there are a bunch of different definitions and sometimes it's not entirely clear what an AI system is. So I would like to offer a different one 
which is a sociological definition. And this one comes from Matteo Pasquinelli's work called, uh, so this book was published in 2023, it's called The Eye of the Master. And so this is what he says. What is AI? A dominant view describes it as the, as the quest to solve intelligence, a solution supposedly to be found in the secret logic of the mind or in the deep physiology of the brain, such as in complex neural networks. I argue instead, I argue to the contrary, that the inner code of AI is constituted not by the imitation of biological intelligence, but by the intelligence of labor and social relations. So if you take this definition, you actually have to acknowledge from the very beginning, from a structural point of view, that AI is in fact uh, heavily dependent on personal data production and on the collection of this data. Um, but here I wanted to insist on the fact that personal data production is also the movement that uh, includes users of platforms. It's not just about people who are paid through work platforms or who are paid, for example, by uh, a subcontractor you can you could think of, of for example Samasource that was the subcontractor in Kenya for Meta uh, for content moderation purposes. Uh, it is also something that relates to people who are users of platforms. So um, people who are um, booking a ride on Uber, people who are booking a stay in on Airbnb, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is a quote from Antonio Casilli, uh, 2018. Uh, the platformization as uh, putting light, platformization in the sense of putting users to work. And so this is what he says. Service platforms on demand are based on the simple intermediation of delivery of services by individuals. And um, it is in fact a, techni a, technical, a technical architecture that uh, collects personal information, photos, addresses, messages, which will, then, which will then, then be monetized and used to train artificial intelligence. And this is in particular the case for Uber, for in its quest for uh, delivering an automated self-driving vehicle. And in order to do that, they acknowledge the fact that they need so much personal and so much data, which is also personal because it relates to the people who are drivers, who are customers, or who, that uh, deliver food from one place to the other. Here's another example. I think it's like, it's the most um, evident one. I often use this but uh, you can find so many others. Um, <clears throat> Meta has put out uh, another image generator system, AI system, and so they claim, they are very proud to claim that they, it is be better than the others because it's based on 1.1 billion Instagram and Facebook photos. So that means that the workers in this case are not just the people who annotate that, those images, it's also the people who put them out there on the platform and who see their personal data, their photos uh, used in this context. And I just wanted to do a small detour and mention Hito Taylor's um, article, Mean Images. And uh, so this is a striking example for me because uh, what she did, she, she's an artist, she's a German artist of worldwide um, 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 renown. And so what she did was look at Lion 5B's um, image database in order to find out whether uh, there were photos of her that might have been used in any way or in any, in any case, uh, in any way by um, um, AI production, AI generate, generative images. And so she finds that it's in fact, this is in fact the case. So in this case, uh, what I'm trying to say here is that it's not just about data protection, it's about personal data production. And you don't even exactly know when you have become a producer of personal data that is then uh, a source of um, <clears throat> um, um, for AI uh, systems. Right, so this brings me to the part where we talk about regulation because that is my focus. I'm not talking about specifically uh, the conditions of the workers, I'm talking about the institutions that regulate all of this. So there is a lot of incoming regulation. The AI Act, which was voted and passed this year, but is not going to be applied until 2026, which is going to also require new data protection uh, uh, AI uh, agencies, national European agencies to be created, that, um, the DSA and DMA Act, also the Platform Workers Directive, which was voted this year, the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, also voted this year. But all of that, in a sense, is um, 
I mean, it's extremely important, of course, but I think that the core piece of legislation already is already out there and started, uh, started entering in effect in 2018, and that would be the General Data Protection Regulation. So, uh, this is where uh, regulation of personal data protection comes in, because if you are talking about the European Union, you need to abide by a certain set of laws, and that would be the regulation, and in particular, of personal data protection. So if you are an AI company, you are required to abide by those uh, demands. So uh, data protection is a fundamental right. I'm not going to go to, through the entire history. Suffice to say that it is a Europeanization of national traditions. And there are a series of data acts that you can trace uh, from all of the uh, uh, countries that are now part of the European Union. And Gloria gonzalez Fuster, she does this extremely uh, complicated and also uh, necessary work of going through uh, all of those uh, sources. And so uh, here are a few examples. 1970, Datenschutz would be the first law that is relevant in Germany. 1973, Data Lag in Sweden. 1978, Loi Informatique et Liberté, France. And so that's where you go from uh, privacy as a fundamental right to data protection. And so these are uh, sort of the uh, precursors and the idea of these laws is to actually sort of put out um, a series of regulations about uh, everything that is related to the constitution of um, what's it called uh, data logs, so to speak. And uh, the end point of, or the latest point of uh, this uh, long movement would be the GDPR. Uh, in 2016, which is also based on the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So we need to also acknowledge the fact that both privacy and data protection are fundamental rights, and in that sense they're non-negotiable. Um, right, so I just wanted to go through this, like, this very, very small, very brief um, 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 chart that outlines the moment of uh, um, in the date of entry of each country that is part of the European Union into the EU or its, or its predecessors and the date of creation of the Data Protection Authority. And so what you might see here is that um, after, the, to, after the 1995, what happens is that most of the other countries that join the European Union, they create their Data Protection Agency at that point. Uh, there are a few exceptions, of course, which are actually interesting, and we, uh, it would be interesting to have a further look at them. But um, so this is one thing that is actually necessary in order to become m member of the European Union. It is to abide by the fundamental charter of uh, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, and so to ensure that uh, the people that are part that, that are nationals in your country get a right to uh, data protection and uh, privacy. Okay, so this gets me to the point where we need to talk about the role of data protection agencies because if each one of them has this role of making sure that uh, uh, their citizens, the people who are inside their territory, have those rights um, um, enacted, right? Um, and so this is the moment where I show a few examples of the fact that data protection agencies, well, they're actually very actively engaging with the, with the topic of AI. So the Garantie per la protezione dei dati personali, for example, which in, on March 2023 decided to put out a temporary limitation on uh, chat GPT because they argued that it, 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 there, had, there were two serious breaches in terms of uh, personal, data, uh, um, personal data protection. Um, also, you have like this this very very recent uh, um, document that has been produced by uh, the French Data Protection Agency. Uh, this is a webinar that happened uh, on, I think, this month actually. And so this is um, what they're saying is that they're going to produce a series of documents over ten or twenty in order to uh, let uh, in everyone in the AI industry know how they can get um, in conformity with uh, the GDPR, how they can be compliant. And so I outlined one in particular, uh, you can see that it, it's, on the red it's under the red circle there, and that one is annotation. So the fact is that data protection agencies 
are indeed acknowledging how AI systems are produced and they are also acknowledging the fact that they require human labor at some point and this also should and this is also pertinent for the scope of the GDPR and so the question is what do they think of it how do they think that uh, the AI industry can get in compliance with uh, all of this human labor that is necessary to AI production right so I just wanted to mention this a quote by Adbelon and uh, Pierre France. Uh, they did, they conducted several um, um, in situ studies with the French Data Protection Agency. And what they argue is that there is a transformative effect of the field of regulation inside which the technique is progressively caught, so to speak, and makes it today's. Uh, data regulator, because what they say is that at first the CNIL was more of a was considered more of a militant administration, and its goal was to actually try and stop uh, or limit um, uh, states uh, um, and administrations' um, um, excess of uh, power use in the sense of creating new um, uh, data files, abusive and all sorts of uh, abuses. And so uh, actually their focus has shifted over time from public and administrative um, um, control of the public and, the, and, 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 and of the state and the administrations into the uh, compliance, the, the search for compliance in the, in the private sector. So uh, I also think that this quote is interesting because they talk about the field of regulation. So. If you take it from a Bourdieu perspective, that means that you have actually something that would look a little bit like this, an inner field for each regulation, regulatory agency, and we, they have to actually interact with several types of actors, of uh, groups of pressure, so to speak, that are outside of it, and the data protection agency needs to actually uh, engage with them because it has legitimacy and reputational, uh, and reputational implications. They need to engage with them, they need to be acknowledged, they need to have to, to burn, to varnish the, their reputation. And uh, um, this also means um, that the data protection agency in itself is a field um, in which there are several types of capital that are um, uh, necessary in order to um, be able to influence other agents that are part of the same field. Right. Uh, but the question is, it's not just one national data protection, protection agency, it's 27 data protection agencies that are supposedly following the exact same rule. But in fact, they don't because they all have different strategies for investigation and compliance, as well as how they should collaborate or not with the private sector. And this is demonstrated, for example, in this graph that was put out by uh, Ido Sivan Sevilla back in 2022. And this is a classification of the data protection agencies that replied to his requests. Uh, and what he did here was a graph in which uh, vertically you have the tendency to find and horizontally you have the tendency to investigate. And so you can see that they're not, the data protection agencies that are here, that are in this graph, they're not, they don't all belong to the same exact point. So that means that they in fact have divergent strategies and also they have divergent impacts in terms of how uh, they are able or not to exert their regulation purposes. Um, sorry, sorry to interrupt because I I would like to ask you whether you could explain uh, the what is the size of the circles. No, I can't. I can't what remember. What do you mean? I can't. I can't remember exactly. Okay. Okay. I, um, I mean, I have the I have the article, but I don't remember. But for, this, for the purposes of this presentation, it's only the vertical and horizontal axis that matter. And, uh, oh yeah, I, th I think it's the amount of complaints actually that they get every year. I think it's that. Okay, interesting. Where is it? Uh, so it's only the people, the, the data protection agencies that reply to Ido Sivan Sevilla in this case. So he only has like 15 mm -hmm. data protection agencies there. Um, he actually deplores the fact that he didn't get replies from uh, all of the data protection agencies. But yeah, actually, yes, uh, the size of the circle also matters okay. because it showcases how many complaints they, hand, they have to handle every year. And so it's depending on how many complaints. So the percentage here is dependent on the number of complaints they get. So France, for example, I think uh, you can assume that it's around 10,000 10, complaints. And so they investigate about half of those and they tend to find about 
like 15 or 20 percent of those uh so the, the, the investigation could bring it to a fine so yes okay but not necessarily but so they investigate okay. but sometimes they just close the investigation at the end thanks right so personal data protection personal data production this is was the uh, the definition that the, the way i defined this presentation precisely because i don't think we can really talk exclusively about data protection we should consider the fact that in this context we are now um we are in the context of personal data production so um i just wanted to quote this um uh, uh, Meredith Whitaker, because her uh, this is a very interesting quote. Uh, she says, uh, maybe some of the people in this audience, uh, she's in a panel in, Ju in June 2023, um, um, so maybe some people in this audience are the users of AI, but the majority of the people is the subject of, of AI. Um, this is not a matter of individual choice. Most of the ways that AI interp interpolates our life makes determinations that shape our access to resources, to opportunity, that are made behind the scenes in ways we probably don't even know. And then she concludes with the Venn diagram of AI concerns and privacy concerns is actually a circle. So you cannot really, you shouldn't be able to talk about AI without talking about privacy, uh, generally speaking. So that means, in my opinion, this is a way, um, um, this, it's a shortcut, of course, it's just a quote, but I think it's an excellent way to uh, get this point across, which I think is absolutely essential, it, to me, uh, we cannot really talk about AI without talking about uh, personal data and without talking about the regulation of personal data. So um, this is how Pierre Bourdieu conceived, uh, conceives the concepts of fields. So uh, this is a relative field of forces in which you have several groups, social groups, that are um, uh, related with to one with the other. And so this is a topographical description of where they are in terms of how much power and influence they have and how they can determine the field's uh, general direction. So you can also use this to consider um, uh, economic fields. And so this is my goal, uh, in a sense. I wonder what the economic field of AI production actually looks like. And at the center of it, is it pertinent or not to put the regulators as, uh, you know, in this sense, what I'm saying here is that there may be, in a sense, three fields embedded one into the other, the field of a national data protection agency and how it relates with other agents that are uh, pertinent for its uh, work, then the field of the network of data protection, European data protection agencies, and at large, the economic field of AI production. And so in this context, what matters is economic capital, of course, but some sort of AI capital, and AI capital remains to be defined. So in this, in this sense, capital is all of the pertinent resources that are necessary to be able to be an important player in the field. So that means, of course, technical capabilities, technical know-how, legal capabilities, the ability to actually navigate the law and to be able to determine that the way that you are doing things is correct, is acceptable by the regulator. And of course, the regulators have an immense role to play here, but the question is, are they or not in agreement with most of uh, the important um, guidelines that should uh, structure this economic field? So um, um, before I move on, I just wanted to offer you a different definition of regulation, not in the sense of what the law says, but in a sociological perspective. And this comes from uh, the School of Regulation, which is, a th which is a, an economical uh, school of thought that comes from France, of course, just like me, but I mean, I'm biased in that sense, sorry. Uh, and uh, so this quote is from Robert Boyer, and he says, it is possible to define a regulatory mode as the result of the consumption of a certain number of institutional forms. And this is what's important here. Regulation is not just about what the law says, it's about the sort of regulatory pact that is concluded between all of the actors and agents that are part of this field and how they actually have the means to influence each other. Um, and so just to conclude a little, uh, the, research, the, research, the research material I have so far, I have conducted nine interviews so far. I want to conduct many, many more, of course. And even if my focus is, of course, on data protection agencies and the people who are at the core of the regulatory um, uh, field, I, it would be unfair to simply just ignore everyone and uh, in particular platform workers um, and unions and all of the 
members of this field that are not in a dominant position, but who have a, thing, some, a bunch of things to say and argue that the way that this economic field is structured right now isn't fair to them. So I've conducted six, six interviews with former content moderators for Samasource who were working in, Ke in Kenya. I've conducted three interviews so far with NGOs and media reporters. And my goal would be to visit four to six data protection agencies in the coming years and conduct as much interviews as possible with all the members of the, the data protection of the European data protection agencies with a focus on the international relations and AI departments. Why the international relations? Because they are the guys who are, uh, work as a network with other data protection agencies and the AI department. Well, this is self-explanatory. And this concludes today's presentation. The, I'm just going to go through the last three slides, which are the bibliography, so you can have a look at those. And uh, of course, as this is recorded, uh, it's good practice to let everyone be able to uh, go through these references and find them further down the line if you find it interesting or necessary. Thank you. Um, Okay, perfectly on time. Thank you, Thomas. There is in the wait. I need to operate on the chat so that you can see it. Um, <laughs> there's a comment by my colleague Marco Torchiano. Would be interesting to see Ireland in this graph. When yes, you show yes, the, yes. The graph. No way. <laughs> Ireland is a whole different, a whole other topic. Right? <laughs> and we can talk about Ireland if you want. So now it's question time is uh, questions and comments time is open both uh, remotely people that is connected uh, as Marco Tokian did can write can ask to uh, can take, take, take can uh, switch on the microphone and ask directly uh, Toma and uh, as I had uh, many chances to interact already with Toma. I would really not like to intervene myself because I also have other opportunities. So I encourage everybody to uh, to uh, interact with our with our guests and uh, make your, your own questions. I mean, I can start. What, what would you be your What would your opinion be about the general effectiveness of? Uh, uh, national authorities in regulating AI and general data protection regulation and privacy in general, I mean, for the uh, collection of data. I mean, if, if we look, for example, at the Italian situation, which you quoted in your presentations, we had a two to three weeks period uh, during last year where the uh, ChatGPT was inaccessible for Italian IPs because it was blocked by GDPR, by the uh, general, the, the guarantee of the privacy authority. Uh, the situation lasted for the time, uh, for a time of 10 to 15 days, uh, just the time uh, uh, through which the uh, OpenAI could, could uh, bring itself to adapt to the requests of the uh, national authority. So, in my opinion, this was a case where everything uh, worked correctly, basically, because there was a subject which uh, uh, wasn't compliant with the general data protection regulation and who collected data in a not not really correct way, then the guarantor of privacy intervened and the situation was pretty much solved, at least for the point in contentions at that time. Wasn't that the, the way to approach uh, this kind of problems? Would you have done more? I'm a researcher. Oh, right. so, so I'm what not is your opinion to... on this? I'm, I... This is not the moment where I give out normative statements. This is the moment where I give descriptive statements. Um, <clears throat> so this, um, I think, yeah, you could ask a regulator and they would say, they would argue, yes, this is how things should work. We ask them to be compliant, they put themselves in compliance, and this is perfect. And that's how things should go. Because the goal of the GDPR is to actually work with uh, the private sector, right? The, uh, the data protection authorities, they don't have the manpower, they don't have the means to control everyone and to investigate all of the potential data breaches that are out there. So the way that it's been structured and thought of from the GDPR's perspective is to actually work in coordination with uh, the private sector. So they are expected 
to hire data protection officers that that do the that, that do the due diligence from the inside, right? And so when it comes to that specific example of OpenAI and the Garante, uh, um, as long as OpenAI is in compliance, well, everything should be okay. But this is also a weakness because, of course, you are extremely dependent on the declarative aspect of things. So if you have Google and Meta, uh, for example, who are claiming one thing, they say they are GDPR compliant, but it turns out that it's not true, then that requires a lot of work. That requires a lot of investigative power. That requires also, in the case of Meta, there have been like huge fines that have been put out there in by the Irish State Deputation Agency, but that required actually a, a, an immense effort of cooperation by uh, the data protection authorities of Europe because they were not in agreement at first about what exactly the fine should be or the sanction or even if there should be one. So in that case, you have a very clear example of the fact that the data protection authorities, they have opposing theories. But not just that, they also have a very different relative, relative power. So I'm just going to take the chance to talk about Ireland, like uh, this comment here uh, invites me to, and to say that, well, um, the Irish Data Protection Agency has a disproportionate power in regards to how many people are under its jurisdiction, because it's 6 million people, but due to one of the articles of the GDPR, I think it's Article 56, if I'm not wrong, uh, well, I may be wrong, sorry about that, but you have a leading authority for all of the investigations. So whenever you're talking, uh, you're talking about an investigation about Google, uh, Apple or Meta, then it's going to be sent to the Irish Data Protection Authority because it's going to become the leading uh, authority for uh, these investigations. And so that and, and that is because these uh, um, companies have their main... Uh, they're, sorry? Yeah, yeah, they're based in Ireland. So yes, exactly. Based, the, uh, uh, of course. Yeah. It's more like a territorial aspect, in my opinion, more than any importance or relevance one. What it does say is that the data protection authorities don't have the same weight. Yeah, they don't, they, they, relatively, some of them are way more important yes. than others, simply because they regulate some companies that are much bigger and much more important in this field than others. So you need to think of it not just like as a plain thing, but something like um, um, a relative field in which, like, there, in which there are actors that, are, that have more gravity, more weight than others, and pull the weight towards them. Uh, I have a question about uh, your research um, and how, if it looks into the individual exercising of rights, the direct exercising of digital rights. I recently got an email from Slack saying they changed their terms of service and now they want to collect all my data and I can. Uh, they voluntarily opt to be in, but they're going to collect the data to, of course, train their AI models, and I have to go through an arduous process to opt out. Um, another example is I work on the data rights protocol, which is a direct way to ask for you as a data subject to remove your data. And um, there are numerous other examples of uh, individuals attempting to leverage our again without a government direct government intermediary to exercise their data rights within a jurisdiction does your research look into these granular events or is it simply no. okay no that is not my focus <clears throat> um yeah the right to access the right to uh, oppose the right to the need to personal data and all that. But yeah, those are articles 15 to, through 19. Um, I'm very familiar with those. Um, but in this case, uh, my question is about how you can, um, who are the actors, the agents that are pertinent to this field? And if you don't structure yourself as a group, then you will have very little power. So there are, I, in fact, let me go back to this slide to like to sort of illustrate it, right? Um, In this field, you can, in fact, ask where are the NGOs, where are the people who are advocating for privacy, for a better defense of uh, the, the fundamental rights that are related to privacy and uh, personal data protection. So at some point there, uh, you will see, we must see uh, people like Max Remsen and none of your business, right? The NGO, 
uh, that uh, has been doing a lot of work related to the GDPR. And they also put out another complaint recently against OpenAI, arguing that it was absolutely not GDPR compliant and that it was um, collecting a lot of personal information without people's knowledge or consent. Because if you go to ChatGPT and ask them a question about, you can put any name down there. Uh, and if you get a reply uh, about uh, uh, the, their age, their date of birth, and et cetera, et cetera, that means that there is some personal data that was processed at, at some point. And it's not more likely than not that the person that is concerned about that did not really agree to it. There was another complaint that was put out by uh, um, uh, um, a low privacy uh, specialist in Poland uh, with the Polish Data Protection Authority. But, you know, this is one point. It's the economic field in this case, we're talking about like big, big structures. It doesn't mean that those things are not exist, are, don't exist. What I'm saying is, I don't have the bandwidth to do both at the same time. Yep. Uh, I have a question. Um, from your presentation emerges the fact that uh, AI companies rely heavily on uh, human labor. And you were highlighting the fact that <clears throat> it's not just annotation, but also data production. Yeah. Uh, so for uh, example, there was that slide on uh, Instagram photos, which is uh, uh, very explicative. <laughs> yeah, that one, um, which in some sense reminds me of a, um, let's agree on a, let's say, Marxist vision of the society in which we have the capital and the workers. And it, it makes me think of um, some sort of uh, unpaid labor. Uh, you have uh, you don't have the salary in some sense. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, is this topic being addressed? Uh, and uh, do you think you, it will be addressed more in future? In um, are you asking if it's by me or like in general? In general, uh, it is being addressed by uh, people who are proponents of, uh, of course, the uh, digital labor theory. Yes. Um, so, uh, in this particular uh, case, what you would talk about is, among other things, platformization, which is not just the fact, um, it's not just superization, right? It's not the fact, it's not just the fact that you're replacing contract work with uh, um, um, taskification and so called. Um, um, self-employment, okay. but platformization is also the movement of um, changing what is recognized, acknowledged as labor, and what is not acknowledged as labor. So, for example, if you're a contract worker, if you're paid by the hour, that means you can also take a break and go get, get yourself a coffee. But if you're a, an Uber driver, you only get paid for the time you drive. So if you, for example, need to take a break, those 15 minutes are not going to be paid for you. The time that you're going to that you're going to need to do your to do reparations for your car is going to be out of the time that is paid. And so platformization is also this movement that is also true for users. So in that case, and that's also why I, I titled this production, this presentation per personal data production, because and there is some sort of um, unclear thing to me. I haven't really theorized it, but I'm sure that other people have, perhaps Mark Fox, for example. Um, um, Christian Fox, sorry. Uh, that uh, uh, there is a delay, a temporary delay, a temporal delay between the moment that, for example, you put out um, photos on your Instagram and then several years later, 10 or 15 or 20 years later, then it turns out to be used to train an AI system. So you were, in fact, a producer for an AI system, but you didn't know that back then, like you say in 2006, right? Or when you had a MySpace blog or whatever, and you were writing things down on the internet, you didn't know that production was actually going to turn into personal data production to train an AI system. And so does this mean that as a posteriori, something that wasn't labor turns out to be labor because it has, because it becomes valuable, because it turns into some form of capital, you know, because also if you take it from a Marxist perspective, capital is dead labor, right? So just with that, well, there is some sort of problematization there that is not exactly clear to me um, and could warrant some investigation, sure. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, 
question or two? I know it is a little bit out of the scope of your research, but there's something that I think is curious. Um, but privacy is strictly related to the culture. Sorry, I can't hear you. Um, privacy is strictly related to culture of uh, the countries. Okay, so yeah. for example, in Europe we have an idea of privacy that, of course, is strictly related on the, the what happened here during the nazism uh, period, uh, yep. patient in Italy and so on. Uh, in uh, United States, they have another um, way to think about privacy. Uh, but uh, my question is, uh, uh, do you know something about uh, what uh, is the role uh, or uh, what are the methods and uh, I don't know how behave the data protection authorities in other parts of the world like South America or Africa or Asian countries or something like that. So what I can tell you is that post 2016 the GDPR has actually become a product of exportation. Uh, the European Union exports its regulation throughout the world and that is called the Brussels Effect which is the title of a book by Anne Bradford. I think it was published in 2016, if I'm not wrong. And so this is actually an important part of uh, this um, um, consideration of what regulation is or should be. Uh, and that is, it, it's, meant, it's also meant to achieve political goals. I see the GDPR not only as a law of uh, personal rights, but also as something that is an economical law. Um, uh, so in that sense, uh, what I can tell you, of course, there is a lot of diversity in terms of of what privacy means, it's a cultural thing also, but I take it from the perspective of regulation. I do, um, my, focus is on, my focus is on sociological economy and regulation theory, right? And from that perspective, it is true that the GDPR is sort of establishing a standard uh, for many other countries, and not just because uh, you, you see that there are laws that imitate it elsewhere in the world, for example, in Latin, in Latin America, but also because th this is the de jure effect, I think, uh, if I'm not wrong. And they also have the de facto effect, which, is, which has been demonstrated in several examples, where in which companies that are, for example, based in Canada or the United States, they become more GDPR compliant over time, even with people who are not inside the European Union, simply because they need to adapt their procedures in order to be EU compliant. And so this is the de facto effect. And so this is actually changing things um, in many other parts of the planet, simply because there is an exportation of these standards. However, it is important to remember that uh, there are all countries that have a different perspective on this, and China in particular has a very different uh, opinion of how this economic field should be structured. Okay, sure. Okay. Maybe the success of the GDPR uh, in the world, let's say, due to this effect, uh, so this convergence, uh, slow convergence uh, uh, towards GDPR is because it's because GDPR yeah, is not so so powerful in terms of data protection at the end. So well, it is. <laughs> so, it is explicitly so, told the bar is so low that it's, it's well. I, okay, I'll say this: it is explicitly thought of, of as an as a competitive advent, advantage for the European market. That's that's the argument that is put out strictly speaking constantly by European institutions. They say. The GDPR is a good thing for the economy of Europe. It's a good thing also for the economy of the big techs. That they can, they could do whatever they want, even if GDPR was uh, in place. Not exactly. They need to be GDPR compliant, and that's also like you can perhaps start considering it like uh, as a geopolitical game or struggle in the sense that maybe, yeah, maybe. Well, but you see, this is the result that. Yeah, and but the it goes on the web. Uh, hold on, hold on. The result is also huge files, like 300 million euros, 1.1 billion euros files that are sent out to Amazon and Meta and sometimes Apple. I'm not saying that it's good. I'm not saying that it's perfect. I'm saying that, in fact, uh, the European regulator is sort of trying to bend uh, the um, uh, the American companies to their will. Are they willing? I'm not going to say what I think right now, but <laughs> up to you to decide. <laughs> I have uh, a couple of questions uh, to better understand uh, the scope of your uh, research. Yep. Because the first one is very simple. 
I lost the beginning of this lecture, so I don't understand whether you are a sociologist or a lawyer. Sociologist. <laughs> 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 uh, Oof. Oh, that's a. That, so that hit home. That felt bad. I feel bad. <laughs> How do you call yourself? I'm a sociologist. Yeah, a sociologist. Yes. So, uh, I am you, absolutely not a law you specialist. You don't care about uh, what the law says. No, but yes, you I do. care more about. Uh, the social uh, impact uh, yes. of, uh, of the law. Okay. Yes. And, uh, and my second question is, uh, I don't understand uh, whether your research is focused on finding uh, new laws, new regulations, uh, or trying and understand how to apply what already exists. No. Um... My focus is on the regulatory pact that exists or that is being built on the field of AI production at the moment in Europe. So in order to be as thorough as possible and as precise as possible, I limit myself to the GDPR and the European Union scope, because that also includes a, a lot of different problematizations and also that includes the fact that, uh, again, uh, AI is a global chain of production, a digital global chain of production, which entails uh, data annotators producing data or annotating data from other parts of the world outside of the European Union. What is interesting about the GDPR is that it's sort of an extraterritorial law and it applies as soon as you have a European subject or someone who is inside the European Union whose personal data is being used, even if it's in South Indonesia. So that is why I think it's a good way to be uh, uh, to not um, uh, lose myself, right? And in order to have very strict, very strong basis to do this, to produce this work, I have uh, articles of law, the GDPR. This is um, as as um, concrete as possible. As it's as concrete as it, as it gets. I have a, a, a territorial limitation, a geographical limitation, which is also going to, um, at some point, um, um, what's it called? It's not going to last very long, this territorial limitation, because you have data protection, the data annotators everywhere in the world who are working on European data. But still, um, uh, so these are the bases in order to be able to uh, go and do this sociological research about uh, what is, in fact, the regulatory pact that we're finding right now. And it's again, it's not about uh, being law compliant, it's about what uh, the normalcy of the um, uh, collection of data protection and the production of AI systems is. Right. What, what do you want to understand? Whether the laws are effective, whether we do you need uh, some other laws? No, that's 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 what a that's what a, that's what a lawyer does. That's what a, a legal scholar does. I'm no, I, I'm I do sociology. I'm trying to describe the effective aspects of the enforcement of the law and what it actually means uh, empirically, not from what it should be, but from what it is now. And again, that is why I take this definition of regulation. It is a pact between all of the institutions all of the actors, all of the agents that have a stake in it, and they, in fact, end up um, agreeing on some sort of consensus, right? And this consensus is being built as we speak when we're talking about AA production. Are there other questions or comments? I have one other question. Uh, that might be a little out of the scope of your research. Um, in the case of people and where they're located, that's most of what you're talking about. Um, you just cited the first the, the subject that is in Indonesia, and you know, they still have the right to be a European citizen. Um, do you study uh, data and where it's located? Right. So take a compliance law like the Russian compliance law, requiring data centers to be in Russia, um, because that, of course, is a very powerful enforcement mechanism, right, that uh, without that component, um, it weakens the enforcement, um, it lowers the bar of, like, how you can enforce 
you don't have a geographical enforcement of where the data lies. Um, makes it more convenient for like large American tech companies. Um, so does, does this figure into uh, your research? Sort of, but if we're talking about data transfers, that that's a whole other that's a whole other thing, yeah. right? So uh, again, I am um, uh, studying under Anton Casini, who is a very big proponent of the digital labor tradition. And in that case, what we're going to look at is where is the labor situated? Where are the people who do this work? And that would be my main focus. And in that case, you can see that there are sometimes very, very long and complicated chains of outsourcing uh, that go through several countries in order to finally uh, have a, a data annotator um, in, in a third party, fifth party country, right? And uh, in that case, you might indeed wonder where actually, where the data is actually stored. But despite it being pertinent, it's not the only issue when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, um, personal data collection. So, no, not exactly, right? At some point, I, I will engage with that, but not directly. Yeah, because I also imagine uh, a, a labor perspective I, I don't necessarily think uh, data as property is like a really uh, a fruitful way of pursuing uh, sovereign right or rights of citizens. Yeah. But for example, if Uber drivers had their data on their phone as a regulation, right? Um, and then Uber had to license that data, that changes the dynamic of, of course, labor and the power that labor has, you know, um, because the data lives in a different place. Yeah, but you know, it's, uh, one specific thing about data is that it's replicable. So you can say that you can absolutely argue that it's on a, a, an Uber driver's phone, but it can also be on a remote uh, server somewhere and no one will know, will know better, right? And this is what happens constantly. So um, in that sense, I'm not going to engage with that further because that's um, a kind of works. Yeah. Yeah, kind of works. I think there are no other questions, so I would like to thank again uh, Thomas for his uh, seminar. Thanks. <laughs>